Section 19 of Orpheus in Mayfair and Other Stories and Sketches. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Rubinstein, Culver City. Orpheus in Mayfair and Other Stories and Sketches by Maurice Baring. Venus. John Fletcher was an overworked minor official in a government office. He lived a lonely life, and had done so ever since he had been a boy. At school he had mixed little with his fellow schoolboys, and he took no interest in the things that interested them, that is to say, games. On the other hand, although he was what is called good at work, and did his lessons with facility and ease, he was not a literary boy, and did not care for books. He was drawn towards machinery of all kinds, and spent his spare time in dabbling in scientific experiments or in watching trains go by on the Great Western Line. Once he blew off his eyebrows while making some experiment with explosive chemicals. His hands were always smudged with dark, mysterious stains, and his room was like that of a medieval alchemist, littered with retorts, bottles, and test glasses. Before leaving school he invented a flying machine, heavier than air, and an unsuccessful attempt to start it on the high road caused him to be the victim of much chaff and ridicule. When he left school he went to Oxford. His life there was as lonely as it had been at school. The dirty, untidy, ink-stained and chemical-stained little boy grew up into a tall, lank, slovenly-dressed man, who kept entirely to himself, not because he cherished any dislike or disdain for his fellow creatures, but because he seemed to be entirely absorbed in his own thoughts and isolated from the world by a barrier of dreams. He did well at Oxford, and when he went down he passed high into the civil service and became a clerk in a government office. There he kept as much to himself as ever. He did his work rapidly and well, for this man, who seemed so slovenly in his person, had an accurate mind and was what was called a good clerk, although his incurable absent-mindedness once or twice caused him to forget certain matters of importance. His fellow clerks treated him as a crank and as a joke but none of them, try as they would, could get to know him or win his confidence. They used to wonder what Fletcher did with his spare time, what were his pursuits, what were his hobbies, if he had any. They suspected that Fletcher had a hobby of some engrossing kind, since in everyday life he conveyed the impression of a man who is walking in his sleep, who acts mechanically and automatically. Somewhere else, they thought, in some other circumstances, he must surely wake up and take a living interest in somebody or in something. Yet had they followed him home to his small room in Canterbury Mansions, they would have been astonished. For when he returned home from the office after a hard day's work, he would do nothing more engrossing than slowly to turn over the leaves of a book in which there were elaborate drawings and diagrams of locomotives and other kinds of engines. And on Sunday he would take a train to one of the larger junctions and spend the whole day in watching express trains go past, and in the evening would return again to London. One day, after he had returned from the office somewhat earlier than usual, he was telephoned for. He had no telephone in his own room, but he could use a public telephone which was attached to the building. He went into the small box, but found on reaching the telephone that he had been cut off by the exchange. He imagined that he had been rung up by the office, so he asked to be given their number. As he did so, his eye caught an advertisement which was hung just over the telephone. It was an elaborate design in black and white pointing out the merits of a particular kind of soap called the Venus. A classical lady holding a looking-glass in one hand and a cake of this invaluable soap in the other 
was standing in a sphere surrounded by pointed rays, which was no doubt intended to represent the most brilliant of the planets. Fletcher sat down on the stool and took the receiver in his hand. As he did so, he had for one second the impression that the floor beneath him gave way and that he was falling down a precipice. But before he had time to realize what was happening, the sensation of falling left him. He shook himself as though he had been asleep, and for one moment a faint recollection as though of the dreams of the night twinkled in his mind and vanished beyond all possibility of recall. He said to himself that he had had a long and curious dream, and he knew it was too late to remember what it had been about. Then he opened his eyes wide and looked around him. He was standing on the slope of a hill. At his feet there was a kind of green moss, very soft to tread on. It was sprinkled here and there with light red wax-like flowers such as he had never seen before. He was standing in an open space. Beneath him there was a plain covered with what seemed to be gigantic mushrooms, much taller than a man. Above him rose a mass of vegetation, and over all this was a dense, heavy, streaming cloud faintly glimmering with a white, silvery light which seemed to be beyond it. He walked towards the vegetation, and soon found himself in the middle of a wood, or rather, of a jungle. Tangled plants grew on every side. Large hanging creepers with great blue flowers hung downwards. There was a profound stillness in this wood. There were no birds singing, and he had heard not the slightest rustle in the rich undergrowth. It was oppressively hot, and the air was full of a pungent, aromatic sweetness. He felt as though he were in a hothouse full of gardenias and stephanotis. At the same time, the atmosphere of the place was pleasant to him. It was neither strange nor disagreeable. He felt at home in this green, shimmering jungle and in this hot, aromatic twilight, as though he had lived there all of his life. He walked mechanically onwards as if he were going to a definite spot of which he knew. He walked fast, but in spite of the oppressive atmosphere and the thickness of the growth, he grew neither hot nor out of breath. On the contrary, he took pleasure in the motion, and the stifling, sweet air seemed to invigorate him. He walked steadily on for over three hours, choosing his way nicely, avoiding certain places, and seeking others, following a definite path and making for a definite goal. During all this time the stillness continued unbroken, nor did he meet a single living thing, either bird or beast. After he had been walking for what seemed to him several hours, the vegetation grew thinner, the jungle less dense, and from a more or less open space in it he seemed to discern what might have been a mountain entirely submerged in a multitude of heavy grey clouds. He sat down on the green stuff, which was like grass, and yet was not grass, at the edge of an open space whence he got this view, and quite naturally he picked from the boughs of an overhanging tree a large, red, juicy fruit, and ate it. Then he said to himself, he knew not why, that he must not waste time, but must be moving on. He took a path to the right of him and descended the sloping jungle with big, buoyant strides, almost running. He knew the way as though he had been down that path a thousand times. He knew that in a few moments he would reach a whole hanging garden of red flowers, and he knew that when he had reached this he must again turn to the right. It was as he thought. The red flowers soon came to view. He turned sharply, and then through the thinning greenery he caught sight of an open plain where more mushrooms grew. But the plain was yet a great way off, 
and the mushrooms seemed quite small. I shall get there in time, he said to himself, and walked steadily on, looking neither to the right nor to the left. It was evening by the time he reached the edge of the plain. Everything was growing dark. The endless vapors and the high banks of cloud in which the whole of his world was sunk grew dimmer and dimmer. In front of him was an empty level space, and about two miles further on the huge mushrooms stood out, tall and wide like monuments of some prehistoric age. And underneath them, on the soft carpet, there seemed to move a myriad vague and shadowy forms. I shall get there in time, he thought. He walked on for another half hour, and by this time the tall mushrooms were quite close to him, and he could see moving underneath them distinctly now, green, living creatures like huge caterpillars with glowing eyes. They moved slowly and did not seem to interfere with each other in any way. Further off and beyond them there was a broad and endless plain of high green stalks, like ears of green wheat or millet, only taller and thinner. He ran on, and now at his very feet, right in front of him, the green caterpillars were moving. They were as big as leopards. As he drew nearer they seemed to make way for him and to gather themselves into groups under the thick stems of the mushrooms. He walked along the pathway they made for him, under the shadow of the broad sunshade-like roofs of these gigantic growths. It was almost dark now, yet he had no doubt or difficulty as to finding his way. He was making for the green plain beyond. The ground was dense with caterpillars. They were as plentiful as ants in an ant's nest, and yet they never seemed to interfere with each other or with him. They instinctively made way for him, nor did they appear to notice him in any way. He felt neither surprise nor wonder at their presence. It grew quite dark. The only lights which were in this world came from the twinkling eyes of the moving figures which shone like little stars. The night was no whit cooler than the day. The atmosphere was as steamy, as dense and aromatic as before. He walked on and on, feeling no trace of fatigue or hunger, and every now and then he said to himself, I shall be there in time. The plain was flat and level, and covered the whole way with mushrooms whose roofs met and shut out from him the sight of the dark sky. At last he came to the end of the plain of mushrooms and reached the high green stalks he had been making for. Beyond the dark clouds a silver glimmer had begun once more to show itself. I am just in time, he said to himself. The night is over. The sun is rising. At that moment there was a great whirr in the air, and from out of the green stalks rose a flight of millions and millions of enormous broad-winged butterflies of every hue and description, silver, gold, purple, brown, and blue, some with dark and velvety wings like the Purple Emperor or the Red Admiral, others diaphanous and incandescent as dragonflies, others again like vast, soft, and silvery moths. They rose from every part of that green plain of stalks, they filled the sky, and then soared upwards and disappeared into the silvery cloudland. Fletcher was about to leap forward when he heard a voice in his ear saying, Are you 6493 Victoria? You are talking to the home office. As soon as Fletcher heard the voice of the office messenger through the telephone, he instantly realized his surroundings and the strange experience he had just gone through, which had seemed so long and which in reality had been so brief, left little more impression on him than that which remains with a man who has been immersed in a brown study 
or has been staring at something, say a poster in the street and has not noticed the passage of time. The next day he returned to his work at the office, and his fellow clerks during the whole of the next week noticed that he was more zealous and more painstaking than ever. On the other hand, his periodical fits of abstraction grew more frequent and more pronounced. On one occasion he took a paper to the head of the department for signature, and after it had been signed, instead of removing it from the table, he remained staring in front of him. And it was not until the head of the department had called him three times loudly by name that he took any notice and regained possession of his faculties. As these fits of absent-mindedness grew to be somewhat severely commented on, he consulted a doctor, who told him that what he needed was a change of air, and advised him to spend his Sundays at Brighton or at some other bracing and exhilarating spot. Fletcher did not take the doctor's advice, but continued spending his spare time as he did before, that is to say, in going to some big junction and watching the express trains go by all day long. One day, while he was thus employed, it was Sunday in August, when the Egyptian exhibition was attracting great crowds of visitors, and sitting, as was his habit, on a bench in the center platform of Slough Station, he noticed an Indian pacing up and down the platform, who every now and then stopped and regarded him with a peculiar interest, hesitating as though he wished to speak to him. Presently, the Indian came and sat down on the same bench, and after having sat there in silence for some minutes, he at last made a remark about the heat. Yes, said Fletcher. It is trying, especially for people like myself, who have to remain in London during these months. You are in an office, no doubt, said the Indian. Yes, said Fletcher. And you are no doubt hard worked. Our hours are not long, Fletcher replied. And I should not complain of overwork if I did not happen to suffer from... Well, I don't know what it is, but... I suppose they would call it nerves. Yes, said the Indian. I could see that by your eyes. I am a prey to sudden fits of abstraction, said Fletcher. They are growing upon me. Sometimes in the office I forget where I am altogether for a space of about two or three minutes. People are beginning to notice it and to talk about it. I have been to a doctor and... He said I needed a change of air. I shall have my leave in about a month's time, and then perhaps I shall get some change of air, but I doubt if it will do me any good. But these fits are annoying, and once something quite uncanny seemed to happen to me. The Indian showed great interest, and asked for further details concerning this strange experience, and Fletcher told him all that he could recall for the memory of it was already dimmed, of what had happened and when he had telephoned that night. The Indian was thoughtful for a while after hearing this tale. At last he said, I am not a doctor. I am not even what you call a quack doctor. I am a mere conjurer, and I gain my living by conjuring tricks and fortune-telling at the exhibition which is going on in London. But although I am a poor man and an ignorant man, I have an inkling, a few sparks in me of ancient knowledge, and I know what is the matter with you. What is it? asked Fletcher. You have the power, or something has the power, said the Indian, of detaching yourself from your actual body, and your astral body has been into another planet. By your description, I think it must be the planet Venus. It may happen to you again, and for a longer period, for a very much longer period. Is there anything I can do to prevent it? asked Fletcher. Nothing, said the Indian. You can try change of air if you like, but, he said with a smile, I do not think it will do you much good. At that moment a train came in, 
and the Indian said good-bye and jumped into it. On the next day, which was Monday, when Fletcher got to the office it was necessary for him to use the telephone with regard to some business. No sooner had he taken the receiver off the telephone than he vividly recalled the minute details of the evening he had telephoned, when the strange experience had come to him. The advertisement of Venus soap that had hung in the telephone box in his house appeared distinctly before him, and as he thought of that, he once more experienced a falling sensation which lasted only a fraction of a second, and rubbing his eyes he awoke to find himself in the tepid atmosphere of a green and humid world. This time he was not near the wood, but on a seashore. In front of him was a gray sea, smooth as oil, and clouded with steaming vapors, and behind him the wide green plain stretched into a cloudy distance. He could discern, faint on the far-off horizon, the shadowy forms of the gigantic mushrooms which he knew, and on the level plain which reached the sea beach, but not so far off as the mushrooms, he could plainly see the huge green caterpillars moving slowly and lazily in an endless herd. The sea was breaking on the sand with a faint moan, but almost at once he became aware of another sound, which came he knew not whence, and which was familiar to him. It was a low, whistling noise, and it seemed to come from the sky. At that moment Fletcher was seized by an unaccountable panic. He was afraid of something. He did not know what it was, but he knew he felt absolutely certain that some danger, no vague calamity, no distant misfortune, but some definite physical danger was hanging over him and quite close to him, something from which it would be necessary to run away and to run fast in order to save his life. And yet there was no sign of danger visible, for in front of him was the motionless oily sea, and behind him was the empty and silent plain. It was then he noticed that the caterpillars were fast disappearing as if into the earth. He was too far off to make out how. He began to run along the coast. He ran as fast as he could, but he dared not look round. He ran back from the coast to the plain from which a white mist was rising. By this time every single caterpillar had disappeared. The whistling noise continued and grew louder. At last he reached the wood and bounded on, trampling down long trailing grasses and tangled weeds through the thick, muggy gloom of those endless aisles of jungle. He came to a somewhat open space where there was the trunk of a tree larger than the others. It stood by itself and disappeared into the tangle of creepers above. He thought he would climb the tree, but the trunk was too wide, and his efforts failed. He stood by the tree, trembling and panting with fear. He could not hear a sound, but he felt that the danger, whatever it was, was at hand. It grew darker and darker. It was night in the forest. He stood paralyzed with terror. He felt as though bound hand and foot, but there was nothing to be done except to wait until his invisible enemy should choose to inflict his will on him and achieve his doom and yet the agony of his suspense was so terrible that he felt that if it lasted much longer something must inevitably break inside him. And just as he was thinking that eternity could not be so long as the moments he was passing through, a blessed unconsciousness came over him. He woke from this state to find himself face to face with one of the office messengers who said to him that he had been given his number two or three times, but had taken no notice of it. Fletcher executed his commission, and then went upstairs to his office. His fellow clerks at once asked what had happened to him, for he was looking white. He said that he had a headache and was not feeling quite himself, but made no further explanations. This last experienced changed the whole tenor of his life. 
When fits of abstraction had occurred to him before, he had not troubled about them, and after his first strange experience he had felt only vaguely interested. But now it was a different matter. He was consumed with dread, lest the thing should occur again. He did not want to get back to that green world in that oily sea. He did not want to hear the whistling noise and to be pursued by an invisible enemy. So much did the dread of this weigh on him that he refused to go to the telephone lest the act of telephoning should set a light in his mind, the train of associations, and bring his thoughts back to his dreadful experience. Shortly after this he went for leave, and following the doctor's advice he spent it by the sea. During all this time he was perfectly well and not once troubled by his curious fits. He returned to London in the autumn, refreshed and well. On the first day that he went into the office, a friend of his telephoned. When he was told that the line was being held for him, he hesitated, but at last he went down to the telephone office. He remained away twenty minutes. Finally, his prolonged absence was noticed and he was sent for. He was found in the telephone room, stiff and unconscious, having fallen forward on the telephone desk. His face was quite white, and his eyes wide open, and glazed with an expression of piteous and harrowing terror. When they tried to revive him, their efforts were in vain. A doctor was sent for, and he said, that Fletcher had died of heart disease. End of section 19. Recording by Alan Rubenstein, Culver City. Section 20 of Orpheus and Mayfair and Other Stories and Sketches. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo Orpheus and Mayfair and Other Stories and Sketches by Maurice Baring The Fire Before the bell had time to sound the alarm, a huge pillar of smoke and flame leaping high in the breathless august night told the whole village the news of the fire men women and children hurried to the burning place the firemen galloped down the ruddy road with their barrels of water and hand pumps yelling the bell rang with hurried throbbing beats the fire which was further off than it seemed to be at first sight was in the middle of the village two houses were burning a house built of bricks and a wooden cottage the flame was prodigious it soared into the sky like the eruption of a volcano and the wooden cottage with its flat logs and blazing roof looked like a sacrificial pyre consuming the body of some warrior or viking in the light of the flames the soft sky which was starless and flooded with stillness by the large full moon, had turned from blue to green. A dense crowd had gathered round the burning houses. The firemen, working like bees, were doing what they could to extinguish the flames and to prevent the fire spreading. Volunteers from the crowd helped them. One man climbed up on the edge of the wooden house where the flames had been overcome, and shoveled earth from the roof on the little flames, which were leaping like earth spirits from the ground. His wife stood below and called on him in forcible language to descend from such a dangerous place. The crowd jeered at her fears, and she spoke her mind to them in frank and unvarnished terms. It was St. John the Baptist's day, some of the men had been celebrating the feast by drinking. One of them, out of the fullness of his heart, cried out, Oh, how happy I am! I'm drunk, 
and there's a fire, and all at the same time. But most of the crowd, they looked like black shadows against the glare, looked on quietly, every now and then making comments on the situation. One of the peasants tried to knock down the burning house with an axe. He failed. Someone not far off was playing an accordion and singing a monotonous, rhythmical song. Amidst the shifting crowd of shadows, I noticed a strange figure, who beckoned to me. I see you are short-sighted, he said. Let me lend you a glass. His voice sounded thin and distant, and he handed me a piece of glass which seemed to be more opaque than transparent. I looked through it, and I noticed a difference in things. The cottages had disappeared. In their place were great high buildings with lofty porticos, broad columns, and carved friezes. But flames were leaping round them, intenser and greater than before, and the noise of the fire had increased. In front of me was an open court, in the centre of which was an altar, and to the right of this altar stood an old bay tree. An old man and a grey haired woman were clinging to this altar. It was drenched with blood, and on the steps of it lay several bodies of young men clothed in armour, but squalid with dust and blood. I had scarcely become aware of the scene before a great cloud of smoke passed through the court, and when it rose, I saw there had been another change. In that few moments' space, the fire seemed to have wrought incredible havoc. Nothing was left of all the tall, pillared buildings, the friezes and the porticos, the altar, the bay tree and the bodies, nothing but the pile of logs which vomited a rolling cloud of flame and smoke into the sky. The moon was still shining calmly, and the sky was softer and greener. On the ground there were hundreds of dead and dying men. The dying were groaning in their agony. Far away on the horizon there was a thin line of light, a faint trembling thread as though of foam, and I seemed to hear the moaning of the sea. All at once a woman walked in front of the burning pile. She was tall, and silken folds clothed the perfect lines of her body, and fell straight to the ground. She walked royally, and when she moved her gestures were like the rhythm of majestic music. The firelight shone on her hair, which was bound with a narrow golden band. Her hair was like a cloud of spun sunshine, and it seemed brighter than the flames. She was walking with downcast eyes, for presently she looked up. Her face was calm and faultless as skillfully hewn marble, and it seemed to be made of some substance different from the clay which goes to the making of men and women. It was not an angel's face. It was not a divine face. Neither was it a wicked face, nor had it anything cruel, nor anything of the siren or the witch. Love and pleasure seemed to have moulded the flower-like lips, but an infinite carelessness shone in the still blue eyes. They seemed like two seas that had never known what winds and tempests mean, but which bask for ever under unruffled skies lulled by a slumber-scented breeze. She looked up at the fire and smiled, and at that smile one thought the heavens must open and the stars break into song. So marvelous was its loveliness, so infinitely radiant the glory of it. She was a woman, and yet more than a woman, a creature of the earth, yet fashioned of pearls and dew and the petals of flowers, delicate as a gossamer, and yet radiant with the flush of life, soft as the twilight and glowing with the blood of the ruby, and above all things, serene, calm, aloof, and unruffled like the silver moon. When the dying men saw her smile, they raised their eyes towards her, and one could see that there shone in them a strange and wonderful happiness. And when they had looked, 
they fell back and died. Then a cloud of smoke blinded me. When it rose, the full moon was still shining in a sky even bluer and softer than it had yet been. The fire was further off, but it had spread. The whole village was on fire. But the village had grown. It seemed endless and covered several hills. Right in front of me was a grove of cypresses, dark against the intense glow of the flames, which leapt all around in the distance, a huge circle of light, a chain of fiery tongues and dancing lightnings. We were on the top of a hill, and we looked down into a place where tall buildings and temples stood, where the fire had not penetrated. This place was crowded with men, women, and children. It was the same shifting crowd of shadows, some shouting, some gesticulating, some looking on indifferent. And straight in front of me was a short, dark, and rather fat man with a low forehead, deep-set eyes, and a heavy jaw. He was crowned with a golden wreath, and he was twanging a kind of harp. In the distance, Suddenly the cypress trees became alive with huge flaring torches, which lit the garden like Bengal lights. The man threw down his harp and clapped his hands in ecstasy of the bright fireworks. Again, a cloud of smoke obscured everything. When it lifted, I was in the village once more, and once more it was different. It was on fire, and it seemed infinitely larger and more straggling than when I had arrived. The moon was still in the sky, but the air had a chilly touch. Instead of one church, there was an infinite number of churches, for in the glare countless minarets and small cupolas were visible. There was no crowd, no voices, and no shouting, only a long line of low, blazing wooden houses. The place was deserted and silent, save for the crackling blaze. Then down the street a short, fat man on horseback rode towards us. He was riding a white horse. He wore a gray overcoat and a cocked hat. I became aware of a rhythmical tramping, a noise of hundreds and hundreds of hoofs, a champing of bits, and the tramp of innumerable feet and the rumble of guns. In the distance there was a hill with crenellated battlements round it. It was crowned with the domes and minarets of several churches, taller and greater than all the other churches in sight. These minarets shone out clean-cut and distinct against the ruddy sky. The short man on horseback looked back for a moment at this hill. He took a pinch of snuff. End of Section 20Section 21 of Orpheus and Mayfair and Other Stories and Sketches. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo and Eva Davis. Orpheus and Mayfair and Other Stories and Sketches by Maurice Baring. The Conqueror When the ancient gods were turned out of Olympus, and the groan of dying Pan shook the world like an earthquake, none of the fallen deities were so disconsolate as Proserpine. She wandered across the world, assuming now this shape and now that, but nowhere could she find a resting place or a home? In the southern country, which she regarded as her own, whatever shape or disguise she assumed, whether that of a gleaner or of an old woman begging for alms, the country people would sense something uncanny about her and chase her from the place. Thus it was that she left the southern country, which she loved. She said farewell to the azure skies, the hills covered with corn and fringed everywhere with rose bushes. The white oxen, the cypress, 
the olive, the vine, the croaking frogs, and the million fireflies, and she sought the green pastures in the woods of a northern country. One evening, not long after her arrival, it was Midsummer Eve, as she was wandering in a thick wood, she noticed that the trees and the undergrowth were twinkling with a myriad soft flames which reminded her of the fireflies of her own country and presently she perceived that these flames were stars which soft as dew and bright as moonbeams formed the diadems crowning the hair of unearthly shapes these shapes were like those of men and maidens transfigured and rendered strange and delicate as light as foam and radiant as dragonflies hovering over a pool they were rimmed with rainbow-colored films and sometimes they flew and sometimes they danced but they rarely seemed to touch the ground and as proserpine approached them in the sad majesty of her fallen divinity they gathered round her in a circle and bowed down before her and one of them taller than the rest advanced towards her and said we are the fairies and for a long time we have been mournful for we have lost our queen our beautiful queen she loved a mortal and on this account she was banished from fairyland nor may she ever revisit the haunt and the kingdom that were hers but merlin the oldest and the wisest of the wizards told us we should find another queen and that we should know her by the poppies in her hair the whiteness of her brow and the stillness of her eyes and with or without such tokens we should know as soon as we set eyes on her that it was she and no other who was to be our queen and now we know that it was you and no other therefore shall you be our queen and rule over us until he comes who merlin said shall conquer your kingdom and deliver its secrets to the mortal world then shall you abandon the kingdom of the fairies the everlasting limbo shall receive you it was one summer's day a long time ago many and many years after proserpine had become queen of the fairies that a butcher's apprentice called william was enjoying a holiday and strolling in the woods with no other purpose than to stroll and enjoy the fresh air and the cool leaves and the song of the birds william loved the sights and sounds of the country unlike many boys of his age he was not deeply versed in the habits of birds and beasts but devoted his spare time to reading such books as he could borrow from the village schoolmaster whose school he had lately left to go into trade or to taking part in the games of his companions for he loved human fellowship and the talk and laughter of his fellow creatures the day was hot it was midsummer day and william having stumbled on a convenient mound fell asleep and he dreamt a curious dream he thought he saw a beautiful maiden walking towards him she was tall and clothed in dark draperies and her hair was bound with a coronal of scarlet flowers her face was pale and lustrous and he could not see her eyes because they were veiled she approached him and said you are he who has been chosen to try to conquer my kingdom which is fairy and to possess it if indeed you are able to endure the fierce ordeal and to perform the three dreadful tasks which have been appointed if he who sets out to conquer my kingdom should fail in any one of the three tasks he dies and the world hears of him no more many have tried and failed and william said he would try with all his might to conquer the fairy kingdom and he asked what the three tasks might be the maiden who was none other than proserpine queen of the fairies told him that the first task was to pluck the crystal apple from the laughing tree and second to pluck the blood-red rose from the fiery rose tree and the third to 
to call the white poppy from the quiet fields. William asked her how he was to set about these tasks. Proserpine told him that he had but to accept the quest, and all would be made clear. So he accepted the quest without further talk. Immediately, Proserpine vanished, and William found himself in a large green garden of fruit trees, and in the distance he heard the noise of rippling laughter. He walked along many paths to the place whence he thought the laughter came, until he found a large fruit tree which grew by itself. It was laden with fruit, and from one of its boughs hung a crystal apple which shone with all the colors of the rainbow. But the tree was guarded by a hideous old hag, covered with sores and leprous scales, loathsome to behold. And a laughing voice came from the tree, saying, He who would pluck the crystal apple must embrace its guardian. And William looked at her, and felt no loathing, but rather a deep pity, so that tears welled in his eyes and dropped on her and he took her face in his hands to embrace her, and as he did so, she changed into a beautiful maiden with veiled eyes, who plucked the crystal apple from the tree, and gave it to him and vanished. Then the garden changed its semblance, and all around him there seemed to be a hedge of smoking thorns, and before him a fiery tree on which blood-red roses shone like rubies. The tree was guarded by a maiden with long gray eyes and flowing hair, and of spun moonshine, beautiful exceedingly, and a moaning voice came from the tree, saying, He who would pluck the rose must slay its guardian. On the grass beneath the tree lay an unsheathed sword. William took the sword in his hands. But the maiden looked at him piteously and wept, so that he hesitated. Then, hardening himself, he plunged the sword into her heart, and a great moan was heard, and the fire disappeared, and only a withered rose tree stood before him. Then he heard the voice say that he must pierce his own heart with a thorn from the tree, and let the blood fall upon its roots. This he did. And, as he did so, he felt the sharpness of death, as though the last dreadful moment had come. But as the drops of blood fell on the roots, the beautiful maiden with veiled eyes, whom he had seen before, stood before him, and gave him the blood-red rose. And she touched his wound, and straightway it was healed. Then the garden vanished altogether, and he stood before a dark porch, in a gate beyond which he caught a pale glimmer, and by the porch stood a terrible shape, a hooded skeleton bearing a scythe, with white sockets of fire which had no eyes in them, but which were so terrible that no mortal could look on them and live. And here he heard a voice saying, He who would call the white poppy must look into the eyes of its guardian and take the scythe from the bony hands. And William seized the scythe, and an icy darkness descended upon him, and he felt dizzy and faint. Yet he persisted and wrestled with the skeleton, although the darkness seemed to be overwhelming him. He tore the hood from the bony head, and he looked boldly into the fiery sockets. Then, with a crash of thunder, the skeleton vanished, and the maiden, with veiled eyes, led him through the gate into the quiet fields, and there he called the white poppy. Then the maiden turned to him and unveiled herself, and it was Proserpine, the queen of the fairies. You have conquered, she said, and the fairy kingdom is yours forever and you shall visit it and dwell in it whenever you desire, and reveal its sounds and its sights to the mortals of the world. And in my kingdom you shall see, as though in a mirror, the pageant of mankind, the scroll of history, and the story of man which is written brave, golden, and glowing letters of blood and tears 
and fire and there is nothing in the soul of man that shall be hid from you and you shall speak the secrets of my kingdom to mortal men with a voice of gold and honey and when you grow weary of life you shall withdraw forever into the island of fairy voices which lies in the heart of my kingdom and as for me i go to the everlasting limbo then proserpine vanished and william awoke from his dream and went home to his butcher's shop soon after this he left his native village and went to london where he became well known although how his surname shall be spelt is a matter of dispute some spelling it shakespeare some shakespeare and some shakespeare End of section 21section twenty two of orpheus in mayfair and other stories and sketches this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org orpheus in mayfair and other stories and sketches by maurice barring section twenty two the icon Farrell was an intellectual, and he prided himself on that fact. At Cambridge he had narrowly missed being a senior wrangler, and his principal study there had been lunar theory. But when he came down from Cambridge for good, being a man of some means, he travelled. For a year he was an honorary attaché at one of the big embassies. He finally settled in London with a vague idea of some day writing a magnum opus about the stupidity of mankind, for he had come to the conclusion by the age of twenty-five that all men were stupid, irreclaimably, irredeemably stupid, that everything was wrong, that all literature was really bad, all art much overrated, and all music tedious in the long run. The years slipped by and he never began his magnum opus he joined a literary club instead and discussed the current topic of the day sometimes he wrote a short article never in the daily press which he despised nor in the reviews for he never wrote anything as long as a magazine article but in a literary weekly he would express in weary and polished phrases the unemphatic boredom or the mitigated approval with which the works of his fellow men inspired him he was the kind of man who had nothing in him you could positively dislike but to whom you could not talk for five minutes without having a vague sensation of blight things seemed to shrivel up in his presence as though they had been touched by an insidious east wind a subtle frost a secret chill he never praised anything though he sometimes condescended to approve the faint puffs of blame in which he more generally indulged were never sharp or heavy but were like the smoke rings of a cigarette which a man indolently smoking blows from time to time up to the ceiling he lived in rooms in the temple they were comfortably not luxuriously furnished a great many french books french was the only modern language worth reading he used to say a few modern german etchings a low turkish divan and some egyptian antiquities made up the furniture of his two sitting-rooms above all things he despised greek art it was he said decadent the egyptians and the germans were in his opinion the only people who knew anything about the plastic arts whereas the only music he could endure was that of the modern french school over his chimney-piece there was a large german landscape in oils called imvolde it represented a wood at twilight in the autumn and if you looked at it carefully and for a long time you saw that the objects depicted were meant to be trees from which the leaves were falling but if you looked at the picture carelessly and from a distance it looked like a man of war on a rough sea for which it was frequently taken much to farrell's annoyance one day an artist friend of his presented him with a small chinese god made of crystal he put this on his chimney-piece 
it was on the evening of the day on which he received this gift that he dined together with a friend named sledge who had travelled much in eastern countries at his club after dinner they went to ferrell's rooms to smoke and to talk he wanted to show sledge his antiquities which consisted of three large egyptian statuettes a small green egyptian god and the chinese idol which had lately been given sledge who was a middle-aged bearded man frank and unconventional examined the antiquities with care pronounced them to be genuine and singled out for special praise the crystal god your things are very good he said very good but don't you really mind having all these things about you why should i mind asked ferrell well you have travelled a good deal haven't you yes said ferrell i have travelled i've been as far east as nijni novgorod to see the fair and as far west as lisbon i suppose said sledge you were a long time in greece and italy no said ferrell i've never been to greece greek art distresses me all classical art is a mistake and a superstition talking of superstition said sledge you've never been to the far east have you no ferrell answered egypt is eastern enough for me and cannot be bettered well said sledge i've been in the far east i've lived there many years i'm not a superstitious man but there is one thing i would not do in any circumstances whatsoever and that is to keep in my sitting-room the things you have got there but why asked ferrell well said sledge nearly all of them have come from the tombs of the dead and some of them are gods such things may have attached to them heaven knows what spooks and spirits ferrell shut his eyes and smiled a faint seraphic smile my dear boy he said you forget this is the twentieth century and you answered sledge forget that the things you have here were made before the twentieth century b c you don't seriously mean said ferrell that you attach any importance to these he hesitated children's stories suggested sledge ferrell nodded i've lived long enough in the east said sledge to know that the sooner you learn to believe children's stories the better i am afraid then said ferrell with civil tolerance that our points of view are too different for us to discuss the matter and they talked of other things until late into the night just as sledge was leaving ferrell's rooms and had said good night he paused by the chimney-piece and pointing to the tiny icon which was lying on it asked what is that oh that's nothing said ferrell only a small icon i bought for two pence at the fair of niji novgorod sledge said good night again but when he was on the stairs he called back in any case remember one thing the east is east and west is west don't mix your deities ferrell had not the slightest idea what he was alluding to nor did he care he dismissed the matter from his mind the next day he spent in the country returning to london late in the evening as he entered his rooms the first thing which met his eye was that his great picture Involde, which he considered to be one of the few products of modern art that a man who respected himself could look at without positive pain in the eyes had fallen from its place over the chimney-piece to the floor in front of the fender and the glass was shattered into a thousand fragments he was much vexed he sought the cause of the accident the nail was a strong one and it was still in its place the picture had been hung by a wire the wire seemed strong also and was not broken he concluded that the picture must have been badly balanced and that a sudden shock such as a door banging had thrown it over he had no servant in his rooms and when he had gone out that morning he had locked the door so that no one could have entered his rooms during his absence next morning he sent for a frame maker and told him to mend the frame as soon as possible to make the wire strong and to see that the picture was firmly fixed on the wall 
in two or three days time the picture returned and was once more hung on the wall over the chimney-piece immediately above the little crystal chinese god Farrell supervised the hanging of the picture in person he saw that the nail was strong and firmly fixed in the wall he took care that the wire left nothing to be desired and was properly attached to the rings of the picture the picture was hung early one morning that day he went to play golf he returned at five o'clock and again the first thing which met his eye was the picture it had again fallen down and this time it had brought with it in its fall the small chinese god which was broken in two the glass had again been shattered to bits and the picture itself was somewhat damaged everything else on the chimney-piece that is to say a few match-boxes and two candlesticks had also been thrown to the ground everything with the exception of the little icon he had bought at nijni novgorod a small object about two inches square on which two saints were pictured this still rested in its place against the wall ferrel investigated the disaster the nail was in its place in the wall the wire at the back of the picture was not broken or damaged in any way the accident seemed to him quite inexplicable he was greatly annoyed the chinese god was a valuable thing he stood in front of the chimney-piece contemplating the damage with a sense of great irritation to think that everything should have been broken except this beastly little icon he said to himself i wonder whether that was what sledge meant when he said i should not mix my deities next morning he sent again for the frame-maker and abused him roundly the frame-maker said he could not understand how the accident had happened the nail was an excellent nail the picture mr ferrell must admit had been hung with great care before his very eyes and under his own direct and personal supervision what more could be done it's something to do with the balance said ferrell i told you that before the picture is half spoiled now the frame-maker said the damage would not show once the glass was repaired and took the picture away again to mend it a few days later it was brought back two men came to fix it this time steps were brought and the hanging lasted about twenty minutes nails were put under the picture it was hung by a double wire all accidents in the future seemed guarded against the following morning ferrell telephoned to sledge and asked him to dine with him sledge was engaged to dine out that evening but said that he would look in at the temple late after dinner ferrell dined alone at the club he reached his rooms about half past nine he made a blazing fire and drew an armchair near it he lit a cigarette made some turkish coffee and took down a french novel every now and then he looked up at his picture no damage was visible it looked he thought as well as ever in the place of the chinese idol he had put his little green egyptian god on the chimney-piece the candlesticks and the icon were still in their places after all thought ferrell i did wrong to have any chinese art in the place at all egyptian things are the only things worth having it is a lesson to me not to dabble with things out of my period after he had read for about quarter of an hour he fell into a doze sledge arrived at the rooms about half past ten and an ugly sight met his eyes there had been an accident the picture over the chimney-piece had fallen down right on ferrell his face was badly cut they put ferrell to bed and his wounds were seen to and everything that was necessary was done a nurse was sent for to look after him and sledge decided to stay in the house all night after all the arrangements had been made the doctor before he went away said to sledge he will recover all right he's not in the slightest danger but i don't know who it is to break the news to him what is that asked sledge he will be quite blind said the doctor then the doctor went away and sledge sat down in front of the fire the broken glass had been swept up the picture had been placed on the oriental divan 
and as sledge looked at the chimney piece he noticed that the little icon was still in its place something caught his eye just under the low fender in front of the fireplace he bent forward and picked up the object it was ferrell's green egyptian god which had been broken into two pieces End of section 22section twenty three of orpheus in mayfair and other stories and sketches this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org orpheus in mayfair and other stories and sketches by maurice barring section twenty three the thief to jack gordon hart minor and smith were behind hand with their sums it was hart minor's first term smith had already been one term at school they were in the fourth division at st james a certain number of sums in short division had to be finished hart minor and smith got up early to finish these sums before breakfast which was at half past seven Hart Minor divided slowly, and Smith reckoned quickly. Smith finished his sums with ease. When half past seven struck, Hart Minor had finished four of them, and there was still a fifth left. Three thousand eight hundred eighty eight had to be divided by thirty six. Short division had to be employed. Hart Minor was busily trying to divide three thousand eight hundred eighty eight by four and by nine he'd got as far as saying fours into thirty-eight will go six times and two over fours into twenty-eight go seven times fours into eight go twice he was beginning to divide six hundred seventy-two by nine an impossible task when the breakfast bell rang and smith said to him come on i can't said hart minor i haven't finished my sum smith glanced at his page and said oh that's all right don't you see the answer's one hundred eight hart minor wrote down one hundred eight and put a large r next to the sum which meant right the boys went in to breakfast after breakfast they returned to the fourth division schoolroom where they were to be instructed in arithmetic for an hour by mr whitehead mr whitehead called for the sums he glanced through smith's and found them correct and then through hart minor's his attention was arrested by the last division what's this he demanded fours into thirty-eight don't go six times you've got the right answer and the wrong working what does this mean and mr whitehead bit his knuckles savagely somebody he said has been helping you hart minor owned that he had received help from smith mr whitehead shook him violently and said do you know what this means hart minor had no sort of idea as to the inner significance of his act except that he had finished his sums it means said mr whitehead that you're a cheat and a thief you've been stealing marks for the present you can stand on the stool of penitence and i'll see what is to be done with you later the stool of penitence was a high three-cornered stool very narrow at the top when boys in this division misbehaved themselves they had to stand on it during the rest of the lesson in the middle of the room hart minor fetched the stool of penitence and climbed up on it it wobbled horribly after the lesson which was punctuated throughout by mr whitehead with bitter comments on the enormity of theft the boys went to chapel smith and hart were in the choir they wore white surplices which were put on in the vestry hart minor who knew that he was in for a terrific row of some kind thought he observed something unusual in the conduct of the masters who were assembled in the vestry they were all tittering mr whitehead seemed to be convulsed with uncontrollable laughter the choir walked up the aisle 
Hart Minor noticed that all the boys in the school and the servants who sat behind them and the master's wife who sat in front and the organist who played the harmonium were all staring at him with unwonted interest. The boys were nudging each other. He could not understand why. When the service, which lasted twenty minutes, was over, and the boys came out of chapel, Hart Minor was the centre of a jeering crowd of boys. He asked Smith what the cause of this was, and Smith confessed to him that before going into chapel, Mr. Whitehead had pinned on his back a large sheet of paper with cheat written on it, and had only removed it just before the procession walked up the aisle. Hence the interest aroused. But, contrary to his expectation, nothing further occurred. None of the masters alluded to his misdemeanor, and Hart Minor almost thought that the incident was closed. Almost, and yet really not at all. He tried to delude himself into thinking the affair would blow over, but all the while at the bottom of his heart sat a horrible misgiving. Every Monday there was in this school what was called reading over. The boys all assembled in the library, and the headmaster, standing in front of his tall desk, summoned each division before him in turn. The marks of the week were read out, and the boys took places, moving either up or down, according to their marks, so that a boy who was at the top of his division one week might find himself at the bottom the next week, and vice versa. On the Sunday after the incident recorded, the boys of the fourth division were sitting in their schoolroom before luncheon in order to write their weekly letter home. This was the rule of the school. Mr. Whitehead sat at his desk and talked in a friendly manner to the boys. He was writing his weekly report in the large black report book that was used for reading over. Mr. Whitehead was talking in a chaffing way as to who was his favorite boy. You can tell your people, he said to Hart Minor, that my favorite is old Polly. Polly was Hart Minor's nickname, which was given to him owing to his resemblance to a parrot. Hart Minor was much pleased at this friendly attitude and began to think that the unpleasant incident of the week had really been forgotten and that the misgiving which haunted him night and day was a foolish delusion we shall soon be writing the half-term reports said mr whitehead you've all been doing well especially old polly you can put that in your letter he said to hart minor i'm very much pleased with you and he chuckled on Monday morning at eleven o'clock was reading over when the fourth division were called up. The headmaster paused, looked down the page, then at the boys, then at the book once more, and then he frowned. There was a second pause. Then he read out in icy tones, I'm sorry to say that Smith and Hart Minor have been found guilty of gross dishonesty. They combined. In fact, they entered into a conspiracy to cheat, to steal marks, and to obtain by unfair means a higher place and an advantage which was not due to them. The headmaster paused. Hart Minor and Smith, he continued, go to the bottom of the division. Smith, he added, I'm astounded at you. Your conduct in this affair is inexplicable. If it were not for your previous record and good conduct, I should have you severely flogged. And if Hart Minor were not a new boy, I should treat him in the same way and have him turned out of the choir. The choir had special privileges. As it is, you shall lose, each of you, two hundred marks, and I shall report the whole matter in detail to your parents in your half-term report. And if anything of this sort ever occurs again, you shall be severely punished. You've been guilty of an act for which, were you not schoolboys but grown up, you would be put in prison. It is this kind of thing that leads people to penal servitude. After the reading over was finished, and the lessons that followed immediately on it, and the boys went out to wash their hands for luncheon, the boys of the second division crowded round Hart Minor and asked him how he could have perpetrated such a horrible and daring crime. The matter, however, was soon forgotten by the boys. 
but Hart Minor had not heard the last of it. On the following Sunday in chapel, at the evening service, the headmaster preached a sermon. He chose as his text, Thou shalt not steal. The eyes of the whole school were fixed on Smith and Hart Minor. The headmaster pointed out in his discourse that one might think at first sight that boys at a school might not have the opportunity to violate the tremendous commandments. But, he said, this was not so. The commandments were as much a living actuality in school life as they were in the larger world. Coming events cast their shadows before them. The child was the father of the man. What a boy was at school, such would he be in after life. Theft, the boys perhaps thought, was not a sin which immediately concerned them. But there were things which were morally the same, if not worse, than the actual theft of material and tangible objects. Dishonesty in the matter of marks, for instance, and cheating in order to gain an undue advantage over one's fellow schoolboys. A boy who was guilty of such an act at school would probably end up by being a criminal when he went out into the larger world. The seeds of depravity were already sown. The tree whose early shoots were thus blemished would probably be found to be rotten when it grew up and for such trees and for such noxious growths there could only be one fate to be cut down and cast into the unquenchable fire in hart minor's half-term report which was sent home to his parents it was stated that he had been found guilty of the meanest and grossest dishonesty and that should it occur again he would first be punished and finally expelled End of section 23。section 24 of Orpheus in Mayfair and other stories and sketches。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit LibriVox.org。Orpheus in Mayfair and other stories and sketches。by Maurice Baring. Section 24. The Star. He had long ago retired from public life, and in his Tuscan villa, where he now lived quite alone, seldom seeing his friends, he never regretted the strenuous days of his activity. He had done his work well. He had been more than a competent public servant. As proconsul, he proved a pillar of strength to the state, a man whose name at one time was on men's lips as having left plenty where he had found dearth, and order and justice where corruption, oppression and anarchy had once run riot. His retirement had been somewhat of a surprise to his friends, for although he was ripe in years, his mental powers were undiminished and his body was active and vigorous. But his withdrawal from public life was due not so much to fatigue or to a longing for leisure as to a lack of sympathy, which he felt to be growing stronger and stronger as the years went by, with the manners and customs, the mode of thought and the manner of living of the new world and the new generation which was growing up around him. Nurtured as he had been in the old school and the strong traditions which taught an austere simplicity of life, a contempt for luxury and show, he was bewildered and saddened by the rapid growth of riches, the shameless worship of wealth, the unrestrained passion for amusement at all costs, the thirst for new sensations, and the ostentatious airs of the youth of the day, who seemed to be born disillusioned and whose palates were jaded before they knew the taste of food. He found much to console him in literature, not only in the literature of the past, but in the literature of his day, but here again he was beset with misgivings and haunted by forebodings. He felt that the state had reached its zenith, both in material prosperity and intellectual achievement, and that all the future held in reserve was decline and decay. This thought was ever present with him. In the vast extension of empire, he foresaw the inevitable disintegration and he wondered, in a melancholy fashion, what would be the fate of mankind when the empire, dismembered and rotten, 
should become the prey of the barbarians. It was in the winter of the second year after his retirement that his melancholy increased to a pitch of almost intolerable heaviness. That winter was an extraordinarily mild one, and even during the coldest month he strolled every evening after he had supped on the terrace walk which was before the portico. He was strolling one night on the terrace, pondering on the fate of mankind, and more especially on the life, if there was such a thing, beyond the grave. He was not a superstitious man, but, saturated with tradition, he was a scrupulous observer of religious feast, custom and ritual. He had lately been disturbed by what he considered to be an ill-favoured omen. One night, it was twelve nights ago, he reckoned, the statues of Pan and Apollo, standing in his dining room, which was at the end of the portico, had fallen to the ground without any apparent cause and had been shattered into fragments. And it had seemed to him that the crash of this accident was immediately followed by a low and prolonged wail, which appeared to come from nowhere in particular, and yet to fill the world. The noise of the moan had seemed to be quite close to him, and as it died away its echo had seemed to be miles and miles distant. He thought it had been a hallucination, but that same night a still stranger thing happened. After the accident which had wakened the whole household, he had been unable to go to sleep again, and he had gone from his sleeping chamber into an adjoining room, and, lighting a lamp, had taken down and read out of the Iliad of Homer. After he had been reading for about half an hour, he heard a voice calling him very distinctly by his name. But as soon as the sound had ceased, he was not quite certain whether he had heard it or not. At that moment, one of his slaves, who had been born in the east, entered the room and asked him what he required, saying that he had heard his master calling loudly. What these signs and portents signified, he had no idea. Perhaps, he mused, they mean my own death, which is of no consequence. Or perhaps, which may the fates forfend, some disaster to an absent friend or even to the state. But so far, and twelve days had passed since he had seen these strange manifestations, he had received no news which confirmed his fears. As he was thus musing, he looked up at the sky, and he noticed the presence of a new and unfamiliar star which he had never seen before. He was a close observer of the heavens and learned in astronomy, and he felt quite certain that he had never seen this star before. It was a star of peculiar radiance, large and white, almost blue in its whiteness. It shone in the east and seemed to put all the other stars to shame by its overwhelming radiance and purity. While he was thus gazing at the star, it seemed to him as though a great darkness had come upon the world. He heard a low muttering sound as of a distant earthquake, and this was quickly followed by the tramping of innumerable armies. He knew that the end had come. It is the barbarians, he thought, who have already conquered the world. Rome has fallen never to rise again. Rome has shared the fate of Troy and Carthage, of Babylon and Memphis. Rome is a name in an old wife's tale, and little savage children shall be given our holy trophies for playthings, and shall use our ruined temples and our overthrown palaces as their playground. And so sharp was the vividness of his vision that he wondered what would happen to his villa, and whether or no the barbarians would destroy the image of Ceres on the terrace, which he especially cherished, not for its beauty, but because it had belonged to his father and to his grandfather before him. An eternity seemed to pass, and the tramp, tramp, tramp of the armies, of those untrained hordes which were coming from the north and overrunning the world, seemed to get nearer and nearer. He wondered what they would do with him. He had no place for fear in his heart, but he remembered that on the portico in the morning his freedman's child had been playing with the pieces of a broken jar, a copper coin, and a dog made of terracotta. He remembered the child's brown eyes and curly hair, its smile, 
its laughter and lisping talk it was a piece of earth and sun and he thought of the spears of the barbarians and then shifted his thoughts because they sickened him then just when he thought the heavy footsteps had reached the approach of his villa the vision changed the noise of tramping ceased and through the thick darkness there pierced the radiance of the star the strange star he had seen that night the world seemed to awake from a dark slumber the ruins rose from the dust and took once more a stately shape even lordlier than before rome had risen from the dead and once more she dominated the world like a starry diadem before him he seemed to see the pillars and the portals of a huge temple more splendid and gorgeous than the temples of caesar the gates were wide open and from within came a blare of trumpets he saw a kneeling multitude and soldiers with shining breastplates far taller than the legionaries of caesar were keeping a way through the dense crowd while the figure of an aged man was it the pontifex maximus he wondered was borne aloft in a chair over their heads then once more the vision changed at least the temple seemed to grow wider higher and lighter the crowd vanished it seemed to him as though a long corridor of light was opening on some ultimate and mysterious doorway at last this doorway was opened and he saw distinctly before him a dark and low manger where oxen and asses were stalled it was littered with straw he could hear the peaceful beasts munching their food in the corner lay a woman and in her arms was a child and his face shone like the sun and lit up the whole place in which there were neither torches nor lamps the door of the manger was ajar and through it he saw the sky and the strange star still shining brightly he heard a voice the same voice which he had heard twelve nights before but the voice was not calling him it was singing a song and the song was as it were a part of a larger music a symphony of clear voices more joyous and different from anything he had ever heard the vision vanished altogether he was standing once more under the portico amongst the surroundings which were familiar to him the strange star was still shining in the sky he went back through the folding doors of the piazza into the dining room his gloom and his perplexity had been lifted from him he felt quite happy he could not have explained why he called his slave and told him to get plenty of provisions on the morrow for he expected friends to dinner he added that he wanted nothing further and that the slaves could go to bed end of section 24 recording by ulrike denis section 25 of orpheus in mayfair and other stories and sketches this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim's Vox 4. Orpheus in Mayfair and Other Stories and Sketches by Morris Baring. Section 25. Chun Wa to Henry de C. Ward. His name was Chun Wa. Possibly there was some more of it, but that is all I can remember. He was about four or five years old, and I made his acquaintance the day we arrived at the temple. It was the end of September. We had left Mukden in order to take part in what they said was going to be a great battle. I don't know what the village was called at which we arrived on the second day of our march. I can only remember that it was a beautiful and deliciously quiet spot, and that we established ourselves in a temple, that is to say, not actually in the temple itself, but in the house of the priest. He was a Buddhist who looked after the deities of the place, 
which were made of carved and painted wood and lived in a small pagoda the building consisted of three quadrangles surrounded by a high stone wall the first of these quadrangles which you entered from the road reminded me of the yard in front of any farm there was a good deal of straw lying about some broken ploughshares buckets wooden bowls spades and other implements of toil a few hens hurried about searching for grains here and there a dog was sleeping in the sun at the further end of the yard a yellow cat seemed to have set aside a space for its exclusive use the farmyard was separated from the next quadrangle by the house of the priest which occupied the whole of the second enclosure that is to say the living rooms extended right round the quadrangle leaving a square and open space in the centre the part of the house which separated the second quadrangle from the next consisted solely of a roof supported by pillars making an open veranda through which from the second enclosure you saw into the third the third enclosure was a garden consisting of a square grass plot and some cypress trees at the further end of the garden was the temple itself we arrived in the afternoon we were met by an elderly man the priest who put the place at our disposal and established us in the rooms situated in the second quadrangle to the east and west he himself and his family lived in the part of the house which lay between the farmyard and the second enclosure the cossacks of the battery with which i was living encamped in a field on the other side of the farmyard but the treasure chest was placed in the farmyard itself and a sentry stood near it with a drawn sword the owner of the house had two sons one of them aged about thirteen had something to do with the temple services and wore a kind of tunic made of white silk the second was chun wa it was when the sentry went on guard that we first made the acquaintance of chun wa his cheeks were round and fat and his face seemed to bulge out towards the base his little eyes were soft and brown and twinkled like onyxes his tiny little hands were most beautifully shaped and this child moved about the farmyard with the dignity of an emperor and the serenity of a great pontiff gravely and without a smile he watched the cossacks unharnessing their horses lighting a fire and arranging the officer's kit he walked up to the sentry who was standing near the treasure chest a big grey-eyed cossack with a great tuft of fair hair and the expression of a faithful retriever and in a tone of indescribable contempt chun wa said ping ping in chinese means soldier man and if you wish to express your contempt for a man there is no word in the whole of the chinese language which expresses it so fully and so emphatically as the word ping the cossack smiled on chun wa and called him by a long list of endearing diminutives but chun wa took no notice and retired into the inner part of the house as if he had determined to pay no more attention to the barbarous intruders the next day however curiosity got the better of him and he could not resist inspecting the yard and observing the doings of the foreign devils and one of the cossacks his name was Liskov, and he looked after my mule, made friends with Chun Wa. He made friends with him by playing with the dog. The dog, like most Chinese dogs, was dirty, distrustful, and not used to being played with. He slunk away if you called him, and if you took any notice of him, he evidently expected to be beaten, kicked, or have stones thrown at him. He was too thin to be eaten. But Liskov tamed the dog and taught him how to play, and the big Cossack used to roll on the ground while the dog pretended to bite him, until Chun Wa forgot his dignity, his contempt, and his superior culture, and smiled. 
I remember coming home that very afternoon from a short stroll with one of the officers, and we found Liskov lying fast asleep in the farmyard right across the steps of the door through which we wanted to go, and Chun Hua and the dog were sitting beside him. We woke him up, and the officer asked him why he had gone to sleep. I was playing with the dog, Your Honour, he said, and I played so hard that I was exhausted and fell asleep. After that, Chun Hua made friends with everybody, officers and men, and he ruled the battery like an autocrat. He ruled by charm and a thousand winning ways. But his special friend was Liskov, who carried the child about on his back, performed many droll antics to amuse him, and taught him words of pigeon Russian. Among other things, he made him a kite, a large and beautiful kite out of an old piece of yellow silk shaped like a butterfly. And Chun Hua's brother flew this kite with wonderful skill, so that it looked like a glittering golden bird hovering in the air. I forget how long we stayed at this temple, whether it was three days or four days, possibly it was not so long, but it seemed like many months, or rather, it seemed at the same time very long and very short, like a pleasant dream. The weather was so soft and so fine, the sunshine so bright, the air so still, that, had the nights not been chilly, we should never have dreamt that it was autumn. It seemed rather as though the spring had been unburied and had returned to the earth by mistake. And all this time fighting was going on to the east of us. The Battle of Sha Ho had begun, but we were in the reserve, in what they called the deepest reserve, and we heard no sound of firing, neither did we receive any news of it. We seemed to be sheltered from the world in an island of dreamy lotus-eating, and the only noise that reached us was the sound of the tinkling gongs of the temple. We lived a life of absolute indolence, getting up with the sun, eating, playing cards, strolling about on the plains where the millet had now been reaped, eating again, and going to bed about nine o'clock in the evening. Our chief amusement was to talk with Chun Hua and watch the way in which he treated the Cossacks, who had become his humble slaves. I am sure there was not one of the men who would not have died gladly for Chun Hua. One afternoon, just as we were finishing our midday meal, we received orders to start. We were no longer in the reserve, we were needed further on. Everything was packed up in a hurry, and by half past two the whole battery was on the march, and we left the lovely calm temple, the cypress trees, the chiming gongs, and Chun Hua. The idyll was over. The reality was about to begin. As we left the place, Chun Hua stood by the gate, dignified and grave as usual. In one hand he held his kite, and in the other a paper flower, and he gave this flower to Liskov. Next day we arrived at another village, and from there we were sent still further on to a place whence from the hills, all the fighting that was going on in the centre of that big battle was visible. From half-past six in the morning until sunset, the noise of the artillery never ceased, and all night long there was a rattle of rifle firing. The troops which were in front drew each day nearer to us. Another two days passed. The battery took part in the action. Some of the men were killed and some of the men and officers were wounded, and we retreated to the river Sha Ho. Then, just as we thought a final retreat was about to take place, a retreat right back to Mukden, we recrossed the river, took part in another action, and then a great stillness came. The battle was practically over, the advance of the enemy had ceased, and we were ordered to go to a certain place. We started, and on our way we passed through the village where we had lived before the battle began. 
the place was scarcely recognisable. It was quite deserted. Some of the houses looked like empty shells or husks, as though the place had suffered from earthquake. A dead horse lay across the road, just outside the farmyard. One of the officers and myself had the curiosity to go into the temple buildings where we had enjoyed such pleasant days. They were deserted. Part of the inner courtyard was all scorched and crumbled as if there had been a fire. The straw was still lying about in the yard, and the implements of toil. The actual temple itself, at the end of the grassy plot, remained untouched, and the grinning gods inside it were intact. But the dwelling rooms of our host were destroyed, and the rooms where we had lived ourselves were a mass of broken fragments, rubbish, and dust. The place had evidently been heavily shelled. There was not a trace of any human being, save that in the only room which remained undestroyed, on the matting of the hard khang, that is, the divan which stretches like a platform across three quarters of every Chinese room, lay the dead body of a Chinese coolie. The dog, the cat, and the hens had all gone. We only remained a moment or two in the place, and as we left it, the officer pulled my sleeve and pointed to a heap of rubbish near the gate. There, amidst some broken furniture, a mass of refuse, burned and splintered wood, lay the tattered remains of a golden kite. End of section twenty five. Recording by Jim's Box Four. End of Orpheus in Mayfair and Other Stories and Sketches by Morris Baring.